Welcome back to another episode of controversial topics that actually shouldn't be controversial but are because some people lack critical thinking skills and empathy. To interact with today's video, you're going to need a few tools. Number one, a set of brain cells, approximately three by four centimeters. I purchased these from Lowe's. Number two, the opposite of whatever an echo chamber is. You can find these in any diverse town far away from whatever Yeehaw one you grew up in. I grew up in a Yeehaw town with a small population, so I'm allowed to say that. And number three, a hammer. Not for any real reason, but I wanna make this sound as much like a DIY project as I can. So let's begin. I think every black girl has a story about her hair, about sitting in between the legs of her mom or her mom's friend as they braid and tug and brush and tie, about the box full of hair bows and conditioning creams, about the tall walls of the hair supply store where everything felt possible, where there were millions upon millions of options for the limited space of her head. I think every black girl has a story about her hair, about the charged comments, the backhanded compliments, about the looks or the sneers, about the shame, about the desire of something else, something more manageable, something more acceptable, something that's not her. My mom started relaxing my hair in elementary school. Looking back, I didn't really need much relaxing because I didn't have that much hair. I remember my mom brushing my hair up into a little ponytail, getting a fake ponytail extension, tying it, and sending me off to school. I was in the second or third grade, hopelessly shy, and generally uninformed that I was supposed to feel any shame of wearing fake hair. The ponytail fell off sometime during the day and I didn't notice until my teacher found it near the cubbies. She held it up daintily, like she was holding someone's pair of dirty underwear. And she looked at it and held it up in front of the whole class and said, What is this? Is this some sort of toy? Did someone lose a ball? Which, Okay, she knew good and damn well. In middle school, my mom crocheted fake hair into mine, sort of like a sew-in, but looks a lot more natural. I was in a club, and on that particular day, every kid who participated in said club had their parents come along and attend the club meeting. The day after the club meeting, my friend, who was also in the club, came up to me and told me, My mom said that you would be so pretty if you didn't have all of that weave in your head. By the time I was in high school, I despised fake hair because all the boys I liked prefer quote unquote real hair and all the girls I envied had their hair silky straight. My hair would never amount to that. Years of relaxing and failing to properly handle it left it straggly and weak. It was breaking off at the ends and looked a lot like trodden foliage. My mom told me I had to get box braids to protect my hair. When I finally got the box braids, I went to school in shame. And to my horror, a friend of mine exclaimed upon seeing me, Shania has the horse bundles. Comments about my hair were never left unsaid. Every picture day was accompanied by the infamous I like your weave comments by middle-aged white men who were trying to be nice but generally missing the mark. And then in my senior year of high school, my mom cut all of my hair off. It was like that episode of Spongebob where King Neptune takes off his paper bag hat and reveals the glossiest skin you've ever seen in your life. Bald. No one ever explicitly said the word to me, but it was implied through the laughter and side glances. I wasn't spared from strangers and I wasn't spared by friends. I was told inadvertently because the person who said it was whispering behind her hands to her friends that I looked like a boy in a dress. To be fair, the natural hair movement was not anywhere close to being popular among high school children my age, at least not in my area. It seemed like every hairstyle I got, every possible thing I did to my hair was scrutinized. My hair was not my own. Everyone's opinion, everyone's comments, everyone themselves controlled the way I presented my hair. And this isn't to victimize myself. If anything, this is to expose a pattern. Because like I said, every black girl has a story about her hair, whether that be the stories about how much they love it or the stories about how they were taught to view it with shame. And when I say every black girl, I mean every single one. Even the- In the expansive history of black American and African culture, Hair has never been just hair to its wearers. In Africa, as far back as the 15th century, hair was an indicator of, quote, family background, social status, 
spirituality, tribe, and marital status. The hair was a crown, literally and figuratively. The top of the head, arguably the highest point of a person, was considered religious. It helped African people communicate with their gods who were far above them. Overall, hair was so important that the styling of it was largely trusted to close family. Lebo Machigo states, people thought that if a strand of hair fell into the hands of an enemy, harm could come to the hair's owner. And I just want to include a little side note here because learning this during the research process truly made me tear up. When I was little, I rarely went to the hair salon. My hair was always done by a family member or a friend of a family member. And just like historical depictions of black people doing and getting their hair done, I would sit in front of the person doing my hair, head a little bent forward depending on the style, and they stood or sat behind me. Seeing all these pictures and learning about African hair processes really felt like I was looking in a mirror. <sighs> Okay, let's get back to it. If you're American like me and you were educated through the American school system, the most you probably learned about the slave trade was that one, it was bad. And two, it all ended in 1865 with the 13th Amendment where black people lived happily ever after until the 1960s where everything was bad again and Martin Luther King Jr. came and saved us all with his I had a dream speech and then we elected Obama in 2008 and then we started living in a post-racial society. Oh, except for that small little wrinkle in the 2020 timeline that completely dropped off the face of the planet after the summer ended. The minute details of the slave trade are smoothed over by the bigger pictures that I have just mentioned. When we think of enslaved people, we understand that they were the property of their enslavers, but we don't think about how far that label of property went. Enslaved people were lacerated, mutilated, and often seared with the initials of their enslavers. They were often put in dangerous conditions and situations where their bodies were put to the test. Shane White and Graham White state, badly set legs, missing fingers, and mangled feet were commonplace during the time. And yet enslavers often gave their enslaved the right to do what they wanted with their hair. And style it, they did. Despite not having much downtime and despite being separated from their usual hair products, enslaved people continued to use their hair as a cultural indicator. Their styles ranged from full afros to shaved sides to braids, plaits, curls, and many, many more. It was one of their only modes of bodily autonomy autonomy. Enslaved people even braided rice into their hair in case of emergencies, especially since they weren't receiving enough food as it was. And even that lone comfort was occasionally taken away from them in times of punishment. According to Shane and Graham White, there were little to no instances of enslaved black women's hair being shaved off by choice like their male counterparts. Their heads were usually only shaved in means of punishment by their enslavers. There are especially numerous accounts of white female enslavers who were jealous of or disgusted by the hair of enslaved women, especially if said hair was naturally straight, which usually insinuated that the enslaved woman was the byproduct of unconsentingly interracial relations between white male enslavers and enslaved black women. Overcome by either their jealousy or disgust, white female enslavers often cut off the hair of enslaved black women as an exertion of power. In the late 1700s, the Tinyon laws were passed in Spanish rural Louisiana and condemned Creole women to wear a scarf over their head to denote their enslaved status even if they were free. This was in part due to the pressure from the white female population who viewed their black counterparts as competition due to the elaborate and often eye-catching styles that black women wore during the time. It was a way to shame and strip black women of their bodily autonomy while also propping white women up on a pedestal, an instance in racial history that is often neglected in these discussions. However, black women oppressed under these laws found ways to continue their journey of self-expression by wearing bright colored scarves decorated with feathers and jewels. They continued to wear these scarves even after the United States purchased Louisiana from France in 1803. But by the late 1800s, black hair and the standards that guided it would take yet another turn. I'm gonna tell you that I love you. It's the late 1800s and I'm a black woman in America. I'm so glad I no longer had to live under oppressive laws like the black codes, which previously dictated how I wore my hair in public. Oh, what's that? I can be discriminated against socially and economically while also being viewed as the antithesis to beauty just because my African features make my non-black counterparts uncomfortable? 
Ain't that about him. By the 1900s, hair straightening was a big part of the black woman experience in America. Whether silkier textures were achieved through relaxers or straightening combs, the idea that straight hair was not only superior, but a necessary part of black life was dominant. Black men even participated in the straight hair movement. Notable figures like Malcolm X chemically treated his hair to achieve the popular conch style of the 1920s through 1960s, much to the chagrin of his scalp and hair health. Besides social and economic requirements, as well as one's own personal preference unrelated to race, the need to straighten one's hair also stems from the Eurocentric beauty standard. Something that is often unconsidered when it comes to the media is how seeing nothing but white people or people of color with straightened hair influences, or better yet, damages, people of color watching these representations through the television screen. I can't speak for everyone, but my own relationship with my blackness has been strained for the better part of my life. The media I consumed, while having exceptions, was very white-centric. Black characters in white television shows were often viewed as the sidekick or the villain. They usually even had straight hair or wore extensions. Eurocentric beauty standards have even tainted black media to the point where dark-skinned black women who look like me are never desired and they're often painted as the more masculine, aggressive, and ghetto character that serves as the antithesis to their lighter-skinned and more feminine counterpart. Yes, I'm looking at you, proud family. And Martin, you're on thin ice. There is a long history of self-degradation and assimilation that stems from colonization in the Black community. It's simply undeniable. But what's even more undeniable is the resilience within the Black community as well. Black Americans are creative. The transatlantic slave trade removed our ancestors from their homeland and placed them in an environment completely unlike their own. Yet they still found ways to reflect their culture and create a new culture that reflects the Black American experience to this very day. Black people take pride in our hair. We wrap it in silk every night and we weave it with other materials to protect it from manipulation. And we've managed to make even these ordinary tasks fashionable, an aesthetic in and of itself. Yet we're demonized for it time and time again. We're kicked out of schools, we're fired from our jobs. Historically, our heads were shaven and ruling governments went as far as making laws to oppress our cultural expression. But black Americans are so cool and transformative that non-black people want a piece of the pie too, but only when it's beneficial. And I already know I'm gonna regret adding this section because my cultural appropriation video has proven to me that I can't be a black woman talking about race on the internet. But let's just call it for what it is. In the words of Shakespeare, Alloweth beest real, all the bitches wanna look like me. All those gents doth is copieth looks, stealeth music too. Wanna seeth what bitches doth, at which hour those gents loseth the blueprint. <laughs> Dragon, a non-black person of color, wore a do-rag on top of her very non-black person of color head, it splintered the internet in half like the Titanic. On one side, you had the very valid criticism of Nikita once again appropriating black culture for her own aesthetic benefit, and as well as her constant blackface. And on the other, less valid and quite frankly very annoying side, you had the defenders of Nikita and Nikita herself who claimed that it wasn't cultural appropriation. After all, do rags protect the hair? Never mind the fact that she's wearing a lace front wig and not her natural hair, um, and she could have had her pick from any scrap of fabric to protect her hair if that were the case. But of course, that's not fashionable. Or may we reminisce on the time when Miley Cyrus had a black phase because she wanted to stand out and try something new, only to portray a very cringy and damaging stereotype of black women whilst profiting from historically black staples like rap, dreadlocks. Once again, I'm including dreadlocks. Twerking and the like. Funnily enough, everyone pretty much hated this phase of Miley's life, if only because she looked so damn stupid during it. But I digress. Staples of black culture have long since been co-opted by non-black people as a way to make a fashion statement 
or to appear cool. Because what did I say? Time and time again, black people, especially black women, have been the pioneers, have been the trendsetters, yet have been unmistakably silenced by Eurocentrism in order to keep us classified as inferior. Kylie Jenner thinks she made colorful wigs popular despite colorful wigs being common amongst black women before she was even sentient. Long, colorful nails are cool now, but were considered ghetto or disgusting when black women did it. Hell, even something as simple as the chunky bamboo earrings were viewed as ghetto when women of color wore them in the 80s and 90s, but interestingly enough, they become fashionable when modern times and white people are introduced to the equation. Time and time again, we see things that circulate within and are staples of black culture being viewed as too much, too loud, too colorful, or on the other end of the spectrum, not enough. We're inferior no matter what, even when we are on trend years, maybe even decades before non-black people catch up. And when they do catch up, they tell us that it's just hair. It's just an accessory. It's just a piece I use to make myself seem cooler. It's just something I use for the aesthetic. History, cultural implications, and race be damned. Things that have once been at the root of black suffering or things that have been used against black people until black people made a cultural statement out of them are mere playthings to non-black people. They can try on blackness at no expense. In fact, people would rather protect culturally appropriating people rather than protect black people who receive threats and attacks just for calling out cultural appropriation. I should know. Every black girl has a story about her hair, about sitting in between the legs of her mom or her mom's friend as they braid and tug and brush and tie, about the box full of hair bows and conditioning creams, about the tall walls of the hair store where everything felt possible, where there were millions upon millions of options for the limited space of her head. Every black girl has a story about being told she's not enough, of being ripped off and consumed while she herself is still struggling beneath the waves of hatred. Every black girl has her head separated into millions of tiny sections where everyone in the world gets to say about it but her. Every black girl has been told it's just hair. I also want to thank my five Romeo and Juliet tier patrons, Bozzy, Lily, Isabella, Remista, and Ruth. Without these guys, I wouldn't be able to produce the sort of content that I do, so I heavily thank you for that. And to the rest of you guys who watch, like, comment, and subscribe, I want to thank you as well for making my dreams come true. It means so much to me. Thank you. Love you. Stay safe.